What is up, everybody? We are back, Audio Advice Live, with my man, Will Klein, and the brand new Stradivari G2 by Sonus Faber, right? Yeah. So uh, tell us about it. Oh, there's so much to talk about with this particular product. Honestly, I did not expect to be so enamored with this particular product, right? The Stradivari came out in 2002, or started development in 2002. I think it hit the States around 2003, 2004, but it was Sonus Faber's first flagship speaker. And as the flagship, not only was it, you know, a, an avant-garde design, something completely unique to the rest of our lineup, and really at that point, unique to the rest of the audio world, it was... A sounding board. It was something that allowed us a platform to be able to build on top of. So, so much of the modern technology that we have, the philosophies that we've developed, the different unique and patented technologies were a result of that flagship speaker, right? And it kind of trickled down into the rest of our line and really added a lot of value to our entire lineup. So when we were redoing the Stradivari, which at this point is no longer at the flagship level, right? fifty thousand okay. dollars is basically at the middle of our line, uh, but it's still one of the most iconic and most special speakers that Sonus Faber ever did. So we had to make sure that we're maintaining everything that everyone loved about it, and still adding something new, something interesting, something meaningful from our existing technology catalog, from the new materials that we're using, the new crossover design, the new drivers that we're building from scratch. Everything in this is updated, new, and really takes advantage of the modern Sonus Faber sound. Sure, sure. You know, uh, one thing I remember from the demo, and I'm glad you did it. If you guys have ever uh, been to a Sonus Faber demo where Will is at the helm music-wise, you guys know. Thank he, you. he definitely brings it. The one thing I hate about uh, any kind of hi-fi or audio show is... Hearing the same 10 songs over and over again. And it's, and it's not even, can I get something with bass? Can I get something? What did I asked you? I was like, hey, man, we got something coming up with bass. And you're like, it's actually. Already on my playlist. The next one. <laughs> and, and just to see, like, because I, I love watching those speakers move, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, getting to see these, this thing actually work, fantastic. And, of course, we have the Michi mono blocks, which are Gorgeous, and I love the little display with the spectrum analyzer and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So how, so how much power fan. are you running into this thing? So if I'm not mistaken, these will run 1,800 watts, or a little over 1,800 watts, into an 8-ohm load. This is a 4-ohm speaker, <laughs> so we're down around just over 1,000 watts or so. A, you know. a, a, a thousand watts, you know, it's around there. Okay. Now, does the speaker need a thousand watts to really wake it up? No, nah, you could probably get away with 400 to 600 and be perfectly fine. But does it take advantage of that additional power? And the answer is a resounding yes. This is the first model that we've made that actually has dual 10 inch dual voice coil drivers. Okay. Right. So, what, so why is that important? Dual with dual voice coil drivers, this is really the first time we've seen them iterated in a high-end audio product. This is something that we usually see in competition car audio, car audio yeah, right? right? When you need just ridiculous excursion and control at the very endpoints of that excursion, basically more bass right. and lower bass, right? Or in pro sound, where you need to light up an entire amphitheater, you need to light a whole stadium like up. It's more, right? more about exactly. coverage. Exactly. So right? it's about audibility. It's about being loud. Right? right. It's about having more air movement, but. In a high-end audio configuration, we need to make sure that we're also adding detail and clarity and texture to that low frequency, right? So the real magic to this and what was difficult and what we were able to accomplish is we redesigned both the motor itself, the dual voice coil cylinder, and most importantly, the neodymium magnet slug. Uh, so hopefully we can pull up a picture of this that you can, uh, that you can do a little shot of, but it's one of the most beautiful drivers ever built, right? This thing looks yeah. like a jet engine. It's absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> the back of it, the neodymium part is actually covered in anodized red aluminum because why not? <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> Italians have to make the inside as beautiful as the outside. But with this driver, not only are we getting that additional excursion, more bass, better ability to fill larger spaces, but we're also getting more of that subtle detail. Mm -hmm. When you want to hear the vibration of the stage after the kick drum has been hit, when you want to hear the subtle undertones of a stand-up bass after it hits that low E note, these are the type of textural information, the type of subtle, low-level details that a driver like this is capable of maintaining. And it really just brings the whole soundstage to life. Yeah. 
Awesome. Uh, what did you guys do here? What is this? Uh, what is, what so is moving that? up. Yeah, the let's let's keep, let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. This is really it's kind of a cool story. It's a button. Can I touch? <laughs> exactly. You just tap it a few times, and then the back opens up, and you <laughs> it's like a transformer now. <laughs> So we had a very, very simple question we were asking ourselves. And as we start to implement more and more simulation software into our design process, there's a lot of questions that we can answer without actually having to render anything in the physical world, right? The software is so sophisticated that we can enter in the criteria, the materials, the confines of the movement of the driver, all of the different variables, and we can just tell it, this is what we want to arrive at. What do we need to do in terms of the depth, the distance, the shape, the materials used yeah. to arrive at that, at sure. that, at that, you know, optimal dispersion in this case for a mid-range driver? And what's really funny about this is all we were trying to decide was whether the phase plug, which is essentially just the static part on the inside of a mid-range driver, a good high-quality mid-range driver, that is static, that doesn't move, right? The rest of the driver kind of moves around it. All we wanted to determine is whether it was better to have a flat phase plug a convexed phase plug or a concaved phase plug, right? And at what radian, what angle that should actually be at, right? Pretty simple. And when we came back after the simulation had run, you know, thousands of iterations, figuring out what all the different measurements would be with each shape, with each iteration, with each different material selection, it came back with us, it came back to us with this as the optimal shape and configuration. Okay. Like, okay, what is going on here? There must be some kind of mistake in the programming <laughs> or something, right? <laughs> right, right what's right. going on? So we ran it back through a different simulation software to actually show what the driver would do, you know, this virtual driver that we had created. And essentially what it's doing, and this is important, most mid-range driver actually if you've ever seen a measurement on a speaker, regardless of the driver, mm -hmm. drivers are essentially measured in an anechoic chamber at right. one meter distance, right? For listening, unless it's a near field setup, it's kind of a useless measurement, right? For science, yeah, absolutely. You compare one thing to the other, you can see exactly what's going on. But what's important to us is the driver's performance at real listening distances, so right? At there, least six cameras, feet out, yeah. probably eight to 10 feet from a speaker like this, right? That's where we need the most accuracy. That's where we need the most detail. So what this is doing is it's essentially guiding the mid-range energy as it leaves the, as it propagates out of the driver. It's folding that energy in on itself such that after about six feet or so, it then unfolds. And as a result, what we get is the most consistent, perfectly crescent-shaped front waveform of any mid-range driver ever made. All right, so we're actually making history with this thing. Sonically, you get a sense of clarity in the mid-range, a sense of percussiveness and impact in the mid-range. It's really unique to anything I've heard, let alone stuff in our lineup. So that's, uh, it's a very unique driver, and you will see more you know, of it. the way you're describing it, I'm just take my money. Like that's, <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't that's even, I don't know if I understand this. If I do, if I don't, if I understand a little bit, I, I like to nerd out. I'm a nerd, <laughs> right? If you want to just look at the cabinet, listen to the sound, say, that's the one for me, that's perfectly, yeah. perfectly. I fine. mean, the cabinet does look look pretty damn gorgeous, too, <laughs> right? And then the design of it around the back, you've got this, uh, what, is, what kind of shape is this? It's not a... It's not yeah, a. So it's sort of a pentagon, pentagon sort, trapezoid -y uh, kind of thing. And that's uh, I'm, sure there's a, I'm sure there's an exact shape for it. Some some uh, geometry teacher is, is shaking his head at us right now. But with the original, we essentially had an elliptical design, so it was perfectly okay. symmetrical, just kind of um, you know not not quite an egg shape, just perfect ellipse. And this was advantageous because essentially what it does is it takes our classic loot shape and it almost takes two loot shaped cabinets and puts them face to face, right? So right. you can imagine this kind of be in the back of one speaker, this kind of be in the back of the other. Well, the spine of the loot shape actually winds up being the most rigid part of the entire structure. Right. So when you think about it, we're actually increasing the rigidity of the cabinet by adding two spines. And then with this new modern design, we're actually adding an additional corner in the back, which further increases structural rigidity and gives us a little bit more cabinet volume so that we can work with right. those 10 inch drivers, which require a decent amount of air behind them to really do what they do. And I would imagine this thing weighs a good amount with all Enough that I pulled a muscle when I was setting them up. <laughs> Just one, muscle? Just one muscle? It's actually both okay. my quad. All right. Yes. It's a heavy speaker. It would have to be to support these two drivers and make sure that it's not vibrating all over the place. But what's cool about it is the versatility. When you see a speaker like this, one would assume, even I, um, with experience with the original Stradivari and eventually the um, 
uh, Ellipsa SE, which was kind of a step down version of the Stradivari that we did, finicky in terms of placement, right? The toe angle especially had to be just perfect in order to get the proper balanced presentation from the speaker. But with this model, we have the advantages of the elliptical shape, which basically with this wide baffle design, it projects more of the energy from the drivers into the room, all right? So it almost gives you a presentation that's similar to a panel speaker or a nice electrostat because there's so much of the driver interfacing with the air on an electrostat. There's a sense, even though it's not necessarily louder, there's not a higher volume, there's more energy in the room. So you get more of that intimacy, you get more of that presence, right? Well, this is essentially taking the reflections, what would be lost in reflection points in the room or absorption points in the room or diffraction points in the room, and it's projecting that energy forward to the listener. So you get more of that immediacy, more of that detail, more of that clarity, and especially more of the presence and impact, especially in the mid-range. It's pretty impressive. I was actually, first when we got in here, I was just like, oh man, it's jazz again. And then <laughs> that was a request. Yes, <laughs> it wasn't you. It wasn't you. Good, good to know. And uh, and once you got into after I said, hey, let's get something with bass. You're like, it's coming up. That track was great. And then you went into some more like electronic music. Absolutely. And uh, a whole cadence. I, you know, I, I've heard some other you know Sonus Faber speakers, and I was just like, oh man, there just isn't enough. It's not hitting me in the right spot. But you know, these did. <laughs> so I was, I was actually, I was pleasantly surprised, right? So, Thank you. That means uh, a lot. And honestly, it's a testament to the evolution that we've been going through over the last maybe 15 years or so. Sonus Farber has always had a warmth and a long-term listenability and a very natural uh, a sense of rightness, as Michael Framer puts it, right? And we want to always maintain that. That's part of our characteristics. It's part of what makes Sonus Faber Sonus Faber. What with today's modern technologies and advancements in material science alone, let alone crossovers, cabinet structure, uh, the simulation software that I mentioned earlier, all these different tools that we have in our toolkit, we can really create a speaker that not only captures everything we love about Sonus Farber of the past, the warmth, the beauty, the overwhelming emotion and bombastic nature of the speaker, but we also have harder hitting bass faster, more clarity, more detail. And especially with this model, if there's ever anybody who may have compared a Sonus Faber loudspeaker to another brand and found that the Sonus Faber lacked in three dimensionality and that full wraparound effect and the, the ability to identify instruments way outside of the confines of the speakers and almost behind the listener, right? They need to take a listen to the Stradivari. In that respect, these speakers do things that most other Sonus Fabers do not. Yes. <laughs> like making julienne fries. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, all right. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Uh, I know you're a busy guy. Uh, what are we talking about for retail price and availability? Yes, yeah, so we're looking at $50,000 for the pair, which I honestly have a problem with because I think it's way too cheap for how these perform. <laughs> it's, way, it's way too cheap. Might be you hear the that? Only problem. 50 grand is the way too cheap. The only problem with this product is it doesn't quite meet its price point in terms of performance. It outperforms its price point, right? A little bit of problematic for some of the other higher end models in our lineup, right? <laughs> but we're not going to stop making stuff better, right? And if we can hit the $50,000 price point with a speaker that we honestly and truly believe is going to outperform most other speakers up to the $100,000 price point, then we're going to do it, especially for this, because this is something that we're so well known for. And we really want to show the world our capabilities in terms of the technology, right? Because that's a story that doesn't really get told about Sonus Faber. We can talk about beautiful handmade in Italy and the cabinets and all the, all the artists and craftsmanship that goes into it. But most folks simply still do not know that Sonus Faber is, was, and always will be a research and development company first. In fact, we have many, many, many patents that we've let go to other manufacturers that still use some of our creations to this day, right? The loot shape was something that was started by us. The ring radiator tweeter still used by some manufacturers. We invented that. We're the first company to use it. And there's a bunch of other different technological aspects that have benefited pretty much the entire speaker manufacturing world that came out of the Sonus Fiber Artisan Workshop that people just don't know about. We are obsessed with figuring out ways to make things better. And add to that the... Uh, style and grace with which the, the factory in Italy maintains and continues to output its products and its designs. And then, of course, we've got the amazing prowess of the Macintosh group. So we've got more resources than we've ever had before. Right. Right? So now in Italy, it's not just we're not just designing for Sonus Faber. We have a design lab that actually helps to design the, inter the um, industrial design for all of the group's products. Oh. Right? So it's become quite the powerhouse of innovative, young, hungry, and really talented 
people that all are already fans of Sonus Faber, know what it is that this brand is supposed to and not supposed to do, and can all basically align on a similar goal. So at this point, you know, just with our design and engineering department alone, it's grown by an order of magnitude in the last five or seven years. Right? We continue to build on that team. And now we've got more talented, uh, more capable individuals on that team than ever before. And we've given them more tools than they've ever had before. Right. And this isn't just something that's unique to Sonus Faber. I think all of the design and manufacturing world in any industry has significantly catapulted forward over the last five or seven years because of the software that we have, because of sure. the materials Every, that yeah, we have. Everything because of the sourcing that we easier. can do. The world is a much smaller place than it used to be. Right? So it allows us, and I think it's really, really cool because it allows us to actuate our ideals, to really show the world what our vision is at any particular price point because we don't need to compromise. We can do the years, what, it, what it used to take three or four years of the research, development, the painstaking by hand, trial and error of going through making a, a, a loudspeaker we can be proud of. And so much of that can be done in the virtual world now that by the time we actually render something into life, it's already pretty good. All we have to do is do that little, refinement, little do little those experiments, yeah. and do the tweaks necessary yeah. to bring it to our to our to our lineup. Um, so it's a super exciting time because literally what used to take years and years and years to do, we can do in a matter of months now. So now it's not about what are our capabilities, what what are we capable of doing, what what resources do we have. Now it's about well, what can we think of? Right. Right. What do we believe should be out there in the marketplace? How do we make our name in this in this hi-fi world? Right. So it's just been a lot of fun. I mean, I, I don't think Sonus Faber has to worry about making a name <laughs> in, this, hey, in the hi-fi world. That was Pretty not sure always the everybody case. Knows. <laughs> so um, are they available now? Or? They are. So you're looking at $50,000 for the pair. They come in three finishes. This is the Wenge finish, which I'm in love with. But honestly, the red is stunning. Uh, we also brought back the graphite finish, which has always been my favorite finish. So we've got three different finishes available. They all do with the gunmetal gray right here, or space gray, I guess they're calling the metal work. Um, you're looking at 120 pairs, if I'm not mistaken, that will be released worldwide of the anniversary edition. So the anniversary edition features this beautiful 45 degree angle mitered um, uh, veneer. Right and then of course it features this plate right here that has your serial number and has the, uh, the moniker for the 40th anniversary. So after those are all sold through, then we'll go back to a more standard model, but this will be part of our lineup for a very, very long time. And as far as availability, they are currently trickling into the States. And you know, if, if a person were to order one now, I would say they'd be satisfied within 90 days or so, something okay. like that. About three months. Yep. You hear that guys? So get your credit cards out. Sorry. <laughs> get those orders in. Sell your car. Get <laughs> get everything prepared. And in three months, uh, these you know, you know what I always say, Chan. It's like if your car costs more than your stereo system, you're living your life wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Damn, I'm living my life wrong, I guess. No, I'm just kidding. Well, Will, thank you so much for your time. It's and, absolutely my pleasure. And uh, you guys, uh, these things you got to listen to. If you're not a Sonus Faber fan, these might actually make you a fan because I... Say it, speak. I, I, I wasn't. The truth I wasn't. The I wasn't. I wasn't. <laughs> and he told me on Friday, he's like, hey, you got to check out these new uh, Stradivari. So we came and listened to them today and... I'm pretty impressed. So again, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you guys in the next video. More from Audio Advice Live coming at you. <laughs> Take care. Peace.